Welcome to episode 13 of China in Context. I'm Duncan Bartlett. Today we're going to be talking about China and religion. Well, in fact, we're going to be comparing religion to the predominant ideology in China, which is communism. The Communist Party is officially atheist, but it does, to some degree at least, grant people the freedom to worship God or follow folk religions or take a Buddhist path. What I'm interested in in talking about today is not so much the role of religion within Chinese society, but the similarities between religion and the faith that many people place in the Chinese Communist Party itself. And I'm delighted to welcome someone who's given this topic a great deal of consideration and is therefore, I think, the ideal guest to discuss it with us, Clyde Prestovitz, who's worked on Asia and China for 50 years. In fact, he's been an advisor to five US presidents, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Clinton, Obama, and now Joe Biden. And this year, he's published a great book called The World Turned Upside Down, America, China, and the Struggle for Global Leadership. Clyde, welcome to the China in Context podcast. Thank you, my pleasure. Your book looks closely at Chinese politics. You say that the party, meaning the Communist Party of China, is like God. Can you explain what you mean by that? The party is all powerful. Uh, it does not recognize any limitation on its power. So that's pretty close to the definition of God. I mean, if you think of the Christian God or the Muslim or Jewish God, he's all powerful, no limitation, uh, and he's forever. And I, what I'm really struck by is when you listen to the commentary of uh, somebody like Xi Jinping constantly talking about struggle. Uh, and if you read St. Paul, St. Paul is constantly talking about what could be defined as struggle. Uh, so I just, I think that there's a, a great uh, similarity. Communism is an atheist idea, yet some figures are deified, such as Mao, Chairman Mao, the founder of the People's Republic of China. His face still appears on every banknote. Is Mao a Chinese god? Kind of, yes. Uh, he's a great prophet of the religion. I mean, Lenin is still lying in Moscow. Mao is lying in Beijing. And these are, uh, you know, like the great prophets uh, of the religion. Um, and while, you know, while communism declares itself atheist, it's atheist in a narrow sense. It's atheist in terms of a, a god such as the, the god of the religions I just mentioned, uh, but it demands uh, um, a kind of religious uh, devotion and faith. You say in your book that when Mao died in 1976, it caused a crisis of faith in China. What happened? His wife had uh, organized the so-called Gang of Four, which was really tearing the regime apart. We talked today about the Chinese miracle, economic miracle, but Mao had had 30 years of uh, economic disaster. Uh, and it wasn't supposed to be that way, you know? Here was Japan 30 years after the war, uh, or Korea or Taiwan, far, far ahead of China economically, and China was supposed to have the true faith. Uh, and so in the wake of that, the new leaders, particularly Deng Xiaoping, they got rid of the gang of four, uh, but then they had the struggle with how to reconcile this terrible performance, which was not at all going according to the predictions and the plans that they had made um, with the doctrine of the party. And, and eventually they came up with this hybrid thing of uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. It sounds a bit like the way in which theology has been adapted by different groups over Absolutely. the years. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I couldn't agree more. Uh, and it's, um, you know, and if you think of, again, going back to the Roman Catholic Church, if you think of the Reformation, Martin Luther, uh, in a way, you might think of Deng Xiaoping as Martin Luther, as the reformer of, of the original doctrine. You used another word just now, which often has religious connotations. You talked about a miracle. Well, what you said, actually, is that during Mao's time, there was no economic miracle in China. Mm -hmm. But there has been something of an economic miracle of late, particularly while Xi Jinping has been China's leader. And that's the remarkable economic growth, 18 percent in the first quarter of this year. Is, there, is that being taken as an article of faith by the Communist Party? Uh, well, I think it's actually a surprise to the Communist Party. And I, I think we have to be careful about 18%. Remember that the Chinese count their growth differently than we count our growth. Uh, so the 18% is, is an odd number. Uh, not to say China is not having a big rebound. They are. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, you, you don't want to take that at face value. But having said that, um, I think that in the, in the immediate post mao period, of course, Deng comes along and uh, you know, let's uh, agree for the sake of argument that Deng is the, is the Martin Luther of communism. So you get this new socialism with Chinese characteristics uh, and, uh, and it kind of works. Uh, it, it works because they unleash uh, market forces. It works because they open up to the outside world and bring in technology and, and investment. Uh, but it also brings with it some loosening. Uh, uh, corruption begins to grow. And, um, and a lot of party members are nominally party members, but they don't have the true faith. Um, and, um, and, and, and then um, Xi Jinping comes along. Uh, and she, she, I find a very fascinating guy. Uh, and uh, he reimposed discipline. I don't attribute China's successful growth to Xi, uh, but I do think that Xi has disciplined. He's he's wrung out um, the nominal those who are nominally faithful but not really faithful. Uh, he insists on repetition of um, uh, you know of the prayers and and, and the beliefs of the party. Uh, he's constantly talking about struggle. And one of the things that struck me in your book when you were describing China under Xi Jinping was the huge number of people who lost their jobs or were imprisoned or worse as a result of corruption allegations. People are still being executed uh, on the basis of uh, corruption at the moment in, in, in modern China. So uh, what did you make of this anti-corruption campaign? Uh, well, I th on, on the one hand, and, you know, just as a practical matter, uh, China was, be, was suffering uh, from corruption and, and the, uh, the ability of the party to continue to rule as it had, uh, I think was increasingly coming into question. And so she, by clamping down on that, reestablished the leadership of the party, the power of the party. The corruption had gotten to the point where it was interfering with economic growth and technological advance. And by squashing that, she redirected uh, energy in more productive, toward more productive goals. You talked about Xi Jinping thought and the way in which people were encouraged to study it, almost repeat it as, as a form of prayer or, or a liturgy. And one of the ways in which I've noticed people in China do that now is by using apps on their mobile phone uh, <laughs> to read uh, Xi Jinping's thoughts. What do you make of the way in which the, the theology is being, uh, what do you think of the way in which the doctrine is being distributed now? Well, it's, uh, it's high tech. Uh, and I, th I think of the app uh, as the modern form of the little red book that uh, that uh, people had to carry or did carry uh, during the Mao time. But it's essentially the same phenomenon. Uh, it's uh, worship, um, it's, it's Xi worship rather than Mao worship. It's communist party worship, uh, it's indoctrination. It's maybe more, even more effective uh, because it's high tech.
So is it actually Xi Jinping who decides the doctrine or the theology or the ideology? I mean, he can't be doing it all on his own. He's got, uh, you know, executive responsibilities. <laughs> How much of a philosopher is he? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, on the one hand, you know, I, I don't think that he is a first class intellect in the academic philosophical sense. But on the other hand, I think he has tremendous discipline and he has faith. Uh, he, I think he believes this stuff himself. Um, and I think that he has, uh, uh, he has a, an ability to select people who uh, are loyal to him and who provide him with the intellectual firepower that he needs. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, like a religious leader, he has his disciples. Uh, and some of his disciples are pretty impressive. So alongside the disciples then, who are the bishops, who are the priests, who plays this role of maintaining the faith among the general population? Well, I think there are two uh, lines, uh, maybe three. You have, uh, of course, the, the people, the, his uh, colleagues in the, in the Politburo, the, the uh, inside committee that runs the Communist Party in the country. Uh, and then you have, um, you have people who are in the universities um, who um, provide the, the books, the writing, the magazines, the articles that reinforce and, and that uh, proclaim uh, his faith. Uh, and, you know, you have among among the, in, in the economy, you have um, a huge web of state-run enterprises. These are huge enterprises. I mean, you have to keep in mind, this is something that's mind-boggling for Western people to understand, but Xi Jinping appoints the head of every uh, state-owned enterprise. He appoints every mayor uh, of every city, every province leader, uh, you know, it's as if the president of the United States appointed the mayor of New York and San Francisco and LA and the governor of New York, New York and California and all the other states. And, and as if he appointed the head of the Fortune 500 companies, this is what she does. So he has an, an immense uh, a collection of people who are powerful and people who, uh, many of them uh, are highly intelligent and skilled and experienced. So what happens about people who lose their faith or feel that they can't believe? If after consideration, you come to the conclusion that this socialism with Chinese characteristics is not the right path for you or for your country, is there any scope uh, to follow another path? I don't believe there really is. I, th I think what you can do is keep quiet um, you know, if, if you if you're in the church but you've lost your faith, you don't have to proclaim that loss of faith. You can still uh, go to confession, or you can still uh, you know go and pray, or go to a study session. Just keep your mouth shut. But you're not going to have any influence, any real influence. And the moment it looks like you're having influence. Um, you're going to wind up like Bo Xilai did in, in, in jail or dead. Um, and um, I think that uh, it's pretty clear in China today that you don't want to cross Xi Jinping thought, you know. Uh, and there are, it's, it's so difficult to reach on it because it's so opaque. Uh, but um, there are indications that there's a lot of dissatisfaction with Xi. He's stepped on a lot of toes. His, his anti-corruption campaign, of course, hit a lot of powerful people. Those people have friends. They had their own disciples. Uh, and so I think there are many people who feel that uh, if she stumbles, there'll be a lot of vultures uh, to eat the flesh quickly. 
But for the moment, he's in charge. And, you know, be careful about crossing him. And there's been, as you say, a centralization of power since uh, Xi Jinping became uh, China's leader uh, in 2012. You mentioned another word there which has religious connotations. You said confession. And one of the striking things about your book is the role of confession in the lives of Communist Party members. Can you say something more about that? Well, self-criticism is a tradition with a long and uh, powerful history. I mean, so if you go all the way back to uh, before the party took control, back during World War uh, II, when the Communist Party was holed up in Yan'an, um, powerful leaders like uh, Zhou Enlai uh, actually spent two or three days uh, uh, self-criticizing themselves and, and, and talking in, in front of the Central Committee, telling the Central Committee how they'd been mistaken and how they had effectively defied or crossed Mao. Uh, and, and I mean, they, they, they did this in fear of their lives. Um, and, um, uh, and that has continued to be uh, a tradition in the party and, and it's the one way in which an errant party member can find to get back into favor. Uh, if you truly and sincerely <laughs> confess your sins and self-criticize, uh, identify and describe your mistakes and how evil they were. Let's think about this in the wider context then. Are you suggesting that this clash of ideas between the US and China, this conflict of ideology between communism and the American approach, which includes many ideas linked to Christianity, of course, do you think that's at the crux of their struggle? I do, actually, yes. Um, the conflict is a fundamental conflict of values. And it, this is really spelled out pretty clearly. Uh, there's a document known as, uh, as document number nine, which came out of the uh, 13th Party Congress around 2013. Uh, and it specifically says that the party is opposed to Western constitutional democracy, that the party is opposed to the concept of universal values, that the party is opposed to any journalism that is not that's not censored by the party, uh, that the party is opposed to human rights. So it's a declaration, it's kind of an anti-declaration of independence. It's a declaration of uh, a completely opposite set of <clears throat> values and beliefs uh, than what we have um, in the Western world. Another L aspect of this is that China has laws, as most, as all countries do, but not a rule of law. They have a hard time grasping what a rule of law is. You know, we talk about rule of law or rule by law. Uh, they understand rule by law, but rule of law, which is a limitation on the power of the sovereign, uh, that's very, very hard to grasp. So yeah, I think it's a fundamental clash of values, and in that sense, a kind of religious war. Well, thank you, Clyde. That was Clyde Prestowitz, whose new book, The World Turned Upside Down, America, China, and the Struggle for Global Leadership, is published by Yale University Press. This podcast is produced by the SOAS China Institute, and you can find out more about our activities, including our latest courses and research on our website. The website is SOAS, that's S-O-A-S, .ac.uk. Alternatively, you can type SOAS China Institute into a search engine and it should pop up straight away. But until next time, that's all from us here on the China in Context podcast team.